Um, and so now I will get into a few uh, code examples uh, and uh, feel free to sort of um, uh, use this code as example or, or modify it or add to it if you if you do like playing around or want to play around with this. Um, so the uh, first thing that we need to do uh, in when running in this collab environment is that we're going to actually install the OpenAI package. So a exclamation point and collab gives us uh, control over the, the terminal uh, to install certain packages. Um, and from this, we can then import OpenAI. Uh, and we are going to import it just like this. And uh, an important note, uh, so I talked about these .env files uh, a lot when I was mentioning the package. So Colab has its own version of this since it's online. It's not local to your editor. And these are called secrets. So you can see I've actually put a secret in here that you can't see. Uh, and that's the point. So these are protected values, right? Um, and we can grab it very similar to how we'd grab an environment variable. And I actually included the code on how to get an environment variable from a local environment here. Uh, but just to say, if you do play around with this notebook, please don't insert your key into a public notebook. Please put it in your secrets that are associated with your account and will be properly uh, encrypted. Uh, so just a, a quick note and another warning. Uh, I don't want anyone to share their key uh, unintentionally. Uh, so we can initialize our OpenAI client, open client like we saw in the slides by just giving um, creating this OpenAI object and specifying our OpenAI key. Um, so with that, we've uh, created our client here. Uh, and we're going to just import a few helper modules. Uh, so Tenacity basically allows us to execute a function more than once if it fails. So this is helpful uh, during API requests where sometimes something can go wrong. Maybe it's your internet connection. Maybe their model goes down for a couple minutes. Uh, this just lets us try it more than once. And then this color module is really just for uh, printing out a few messages in different colors to make it a little bit more clear. Uh, so we're going to define a global variable here that's going to uh, tell us which GPT model we're going to use. So in this case, GPT-4 Turbo. And this is the function that we saw in the slides. I've added a few things to it that make our life a little bit easier. One is that you can provide the whole response object, and it will just append that uh, to our messages array. And the other being that um, we can just provide it a string prompt, and it will append that with the role of user to our messages array as well. Uh, so this is just making our life a little easier. And we can see we have all these sort of different parameters uh, that we talked about. They're all set to none, so they're optional. Uh, to revive, but if we do, then those will be included in our API call. Uh, so we can run that. Uh, and uh, we'll go through just a few of the examples that we saw from the slides. So these are also so that you have these functions if you want to play with them uh, or experiment with them in different ways. Uh, but here we're looking at sort of a, a template prompt where we're asking for 50 genes related to a specific biomedical turn, uh, term. So in this case, uh, we could ask, um, return genes that are related to adenocarcinoma. And uh, we'll see that it will take a little bit of time. Uh, and eventually, we will get back an object uh, that has um, some genes that we hope would be related to adenocarcinoma. So here's our chat completion object, like we talked about. There's a lot of different fields in here, such as the ID, when was it created, the number of tokens we used, uh, as well as the model. Um, and we can see that we actually did get our list of genes here. Um, so uh, let's extend this a little bit further. Uh, so here, uh, let's let's do this uh, similar prompt, uh, but we'll have, um, uh, in this case, uh, we'll be looking at five genes related to alopecia. And let's do some multi-step uh, prompting here. So let's, let's have it uh, think about its answer a few times. Um, so in the first uh, answer here, we're going to see that our prompt is actually just asking for five genes related to alopecia. And we're also going to provide it this very basic system prompt that it's a bioinformaticians uh, assistant. And then we're going to follow that up with uh, what diseases are those genes related to. So we're going to see what types of other uh, diseases uh, that those five genes that it produced are related to. And then we're going to go back to the original disease and see if we can get a summary of how each of those genes relates to the original disease. So this might take a little bit to run because uh, we're kind of doing this three times, but we can see the uh, responses iteratively uh, jump up here. 
So it's good that it uh, understood that the alopecia genes that it produced, uh, you can see are also related to specific types of al uh, alopecia, things like woolly hair. Um, and this last uh, sort of um, uh, question here is producing, asking us to, asking it to produce a lot more tokens. So that's one thing you can expect when you're asking for more tokens, it's going to take a longer time uh, for that to come back. Uh, so here we go. And while we're waiting, we can see that it looks like it, it was uh, doing some markdown here, which is sort of common uh, for it to do. And so if we put it in a markdown cell, uh, then we can actually see that it sort of nicely formats uh, our response here. For each gene, it gives uh, exactly what that gene stands for, uh, its function, and then its relation to alopecia. Uh, now, you have to be careful with this. All of this might not be perfectly correct, uh, but this is sort of an example of multi-step prompting. How are we incorporating uh, previous messages and responses into sort of a chain uh, with the API? <clears throat> okay, so we can also take this uh, gene uh, sort of um, publications function that we defined in the slides, uh, and as well as this tool description. Uh, like I said, we're just defining it as a function. Uh, we give it the name of the function description, uh, and then the parameters uh, that we want, which is just going to be, if you want multiple, you can make it a type object, and then you have, uh, as you would in an object, uh, the your different properties such as gene, which is the gene symbol to search. And then we'll tell it that it can't call this function unless it at least has that gene argument. <clears throat> so uh, this is uh, just a function to print out uh, messages uh, based on their role with a different color. Uh, so you can just see here the different colors that we're defining. So that's what that module was before earlier. Um, uh, not too important to understand exactly how that's doing that. Uh, and we can see the example that we saw before. So we can ask uh, about uh, publications. Oh, I'm sure I complete tool. Oh, I did not run the cell. Sorry about that. Uh, so we run the cell. And now we have this tools object that we can pass to our chat completions function here. Uh, and we'll see that um, we actually get that tool call uh, in real time here and that we can uh, parse it um, with this code here. So we're creating this mapping of um, our gene or, or function name. So that's what it's calling here uh, to our actual function definition. Uh, and then uh, we can also grab uh, the arguments, which are under this uh, function call arguments field. Uh, and then this just actually deconstructs those. So it's just lag three in there, which is our gene argument. Uh, and this function map is just getting that actual function name get gene publications. So here is actually the full result of that. So you can see there's a bunch of different PubMed articles that we've uh, retrieved uh, that mention lag three. And then also we have this specific text uh, in there. So you could imagine sort of concatenating this and providing it to the model to try to summarize some of the literature uh, that uh, surrounds lag three. Um, so that's sort of a starting point uh, for using tools just with the base uh, completions, um, chat completions endpoint. Um, <clears throat> we also have uh, uh, sort of another example of using the assistance API. So in this case, we're going to look at specifically uh, creating an assistant to chat with a paper. So maybe this is something that you're interested in doing, um, or maybe you want to just create a chatbot that has sort of all of your papers, or maybe a collection of papers that you're interested in, you want to be able to ask questions about them. So here we can actually grab a PDF. So this is just the link to the PDF for uh, the uh, actual, the Rummagene paper. Uh, and we can grab it with the request module. So that's just gonna grab this document from the internet. Um, and in order to upload it to OpenAI, it has to be in a uh, bytes format. So we're just gonna take the content and wrap it in this bytes IO object. Uh, if you have the file locally, you can just open it as RB, which just means read bytes. Uh, if, you've, if you uh, have done any Python before, uh, and we can then just actually add it to our, um, our, our OpenAI account with the purpose of assistance. So if we run that, then we'll see that we actually get this file ID. Uh, and this is what we can refer to that file to by now uh, when using our assistant. So we're going to give it some system instructions here. Uh, this is what defines what an assistant is. So with, uh, with the, it uses GPT-4, and like we discussed, it's very adherent to our system prompt. Uh, especially with this assistant module. 
Uh, so we can tell it that it has this tool retrieval and then it has this paper um, uh, of the, the that's a PDF. So it's helpful often to specify the type of file you're giving to it, I've found. Uh, it often isn't good at inferring that itself. So now we've actually created an assistant and I've just defined this show JSON ob uh, function earlier just to make it easier to read these objects. So we can see a bunch of information about our assistant now. We can see the instructions that we provided it. We can see it the files that it has access to, the model that it's using, mm -hmm. and the tools, uh, as well as some other uh, formats here, or some other uh, inf metadata here that might be useful. Now, uh, assistants aren't quite as simple as chat completions. They actually work on these things called threads. And threads are helpful because you can kind of continue a conversation that you had earlier with the model um, because these threads are stored for sort of weeks at a time. Uh, so they're basically these uh, these objects, these message array objects with other metadata uh, that allow you to sort of come back uh, to a conversation. So if we first need to create a thread, uh, and that's really just um, with this basic line of code, and we can see that we get this thread ID. Um, and now when we actually want to give a message uh, to our assistant that we have here, uh, we actually need to first uh, create a message inside of that thread. Uh, so now we have a thread that contains a message telling the uh, model to please summarize the paper in a few sentences. Now, I know this is, feels a little convoluted, but now we actually have to run that thread. So we have this thread that it's not doing anything. It just has a message in it. Uh, and uh, we want to run it with the assistant that we created. So we have an ID for our assistant and we have an ID for our thread, and we can actually now run that thread uh, with uh, the assistant that we created. Um, and uh, now it will be sort of running in the background. So we've run that thread, and we can define a little function to just wait on when that's done, which basically just checks if that run that we created is queued or in progress. And if it is, then let's just wait half a second and check again. And we can just check with our thread ID and our run ID. So if we actually look at the result here, um, then we have, uh, let's see what happened here. Um, oh. oh, sorry. Okay, so we can see that it actually completed um, because the, the wait on run finish uh, function finished and we can see our status here is completed. And then we can actually go back to our messages that are in this thread, and we can see that a message has been appended with the answer to our question. So I know this feels like a lot of steps, uh, but this is just sort of part of the assistance module and sort of accessing that increased functionality sometimes requires sort of increased um, uh, like load uh, on the on the the syntax and the the context you have to provide. So here you can see that it actually did a really nice job of summarizing the paper. Uh, we can see that there's hundreds of thousands of uh, gene sets from supporting materials of publications. Uh, and these, uh, there's about, I think in the original publication, there was 642,000. That sounds about right. Maybe it's not perfectly correct. Uh, and then we have sort of 5 million total papers scanned. So this is a nice summary. And you could then go back and forth and ask it more questions about the paper, including sort of the context that we've already uh, discussed. So that thread will just keep track of all the messages if you keep using it. There's no need to keep track of a messages array anymore. So that's an example of using uh, the Assistance API. I won't get too much more into it, but a starting place if you do want to experiment with it more. And finally, we'll just do a, a hypothesis generation example. Uh, so we're going to use a gene set that was published in Cell Aging by our lab, uh, I think, a year ago. Uh, and this is a computational screen that identified um, some genes that were uh, upregulated in uh, senescent cells, but downregulated in healthy cells and tissues. So we can grab this from the actual GitHub uh, of the paper, and we can see we have this table with some extra metadata and then also our actual gene names. So we can just grab this gene set by grabbing our gene column from our, our pandas data frame here. I'm not going to go over these functions too much because I know that you uh, did a unit on these bioinformatics APIs last time. But basically, briefly, it's querying the Rumagene API to get the first most hundred first one hundred most significant results. And then uh, the second function is grabbing the overlapping genes from an ID of one of those gene sets that we got from the result, and then a, a set of genes. So we can run this to define those functions. 
Uh, and then these are two more helper functions that I won't get uh, explicitly into. You can look more into it if you if you want after the lecture. But basically what we're doing is just using the eUtilities API, which is an API uh, that PubMed provides uh, to grab the um, abstracts and titles of, uh, of different publications. So this will be helpful when ranking uh, these publications by abstract similarity uh, as we would, uh, or as we did in the rummaging um, uh, sort of uh, analysis of pairs I showed earlier. So we'll just run those. <clears throat> okay, and then we're, we're, we have another uh, sort of function that's a, a, a little bit better explained here, and it's basically creating um, TF-IDF vectors. So again, those counts of words that are appearing in abstracts and how important they are. Uh, and we're using uh, the Natural Language Toolkit, which is a, a very helpful package in Python for natural languaging uh, tasks and is going to sort of accomplish some of the more complex stuff for us, like lemmatizing the words. Um, and removing stop words and tokenizing uh, each sentence or the, the abstract as a whole. And then we're going to use sklearn or scikit-learn uh, for these uh, TF-IDF vectors. So again, we're not really doing, we don't have to hard code any of this math. Uh, these are things provided by uh, sort of very reputable and well-known Python packages. Uh, so here we'll also import our cosine similarity. So this might start sounding familiar from what I uh, defined in the slides. But we're basically going to grab all those abstracts. We're going to tokenize them and clean them and make them all lowercase. Uh, and then we're going to create them into TF-IDF vectors. And then we're going to calculate the cosine similarity of our um, abstract uh, that we're focused on. So this, in this case, it would be the abstract uh, uh, pertaining to the senescent gene set that we grabbed at the beginning. And we're going to compare it to all the other abstracts in our um in the, our result from rummaging, essentially, is what we're trying to do here. OK, so we have all these helper functions. And I know there's kind of a lot of code there. You can definitely look more into it if you're curious. Um, but uh, the, the, the main sort of um, uh, point here is that we're going to grab the top 100 significant gene sets from rummaging. Um, if there's no result, and we're just going to tell the user that, right? Uh, and then we're going to grab the uh, PubMed or sorry, the PubMed central IDs from each of those uh, return gene sets. And then we're going to get this abstract dict, which really is just grabbing the abstracts for each of those publications that we had from that list of returned results. Uh, and then we're going to call our compute TF-IDF uh, vector uh, function, which is going to compute the TF-IDF vectors for each of those abstracts and then compare it to our original abstract uh, that we had uh, for our senescent gene set. And it's going to then go and rank these by uh, cosine, or, or it's going to add that cosine similarity value uh, to our table of this enriched uh, gene sets. And then we're just going to sort those um, by uh, cosine similarity. So definitely a lot to take in. But here's our actual senescent ab abstract. So you can see how this gene set was created. Like I said, it was a, a computational screen using some of these healthy backgrounds from GTEx and from Arches4. And if we actually call our function here, um, then we should now get a, um, a data frame that has uh, all of our metrics that we're looking for. So we have our uh, gene sets from Rummaging. We have uh, the PMCD there from. We have some stats about that gene set. So how long it is, what the overlap was, what our adjusted p-value was. And then we also have our cosine similarity, which is what we did that, um, that vectorization for. Uh, and, and we computed all those cosine similarities. So let's just grab the top term here. Uh, so it's this one right here um, and uh, from this PMC. And uh, let's grab the ID and get the overlapping genes so we can do some computations with that. So that was that function that we assigned earlier. So we have the ID and then we have the actual gene list for the senescent set. And then we're going to do sort of what uh, I described at the end of the lecture, which is we're going to grab some uh, significant and richer terms uh, that are associated with those overlapping genes. So in this case, that's from Wiki Pathways, GWAS, GoPP, uh, and MGI. Uh, and uh, basically what this is doing is I know Stephanie, I think, went over this last week, but we're adding the, our list uh, of our overlapping genes uh, to Enricher. Uh, and then we are going through each library and just grabbing the significant terms that are returned and adding it to a little uh, a dictionary or object here that we have. 
So if we run this and look at our enrich uh, our enricher terms, then we'll see that we have for wiki pathways, uh, we have sort of MINR targets in ECM and membrane receptors. We see we have focal adhesion. Um, we have from GoBP, we also have enrichment of the uh, extracellular matrix organization and structure. So I, I would uh, bet that there might be some shared mechanism here uh, with the extracellular matrix. Uh, and we'll see what um, our prompt has to say. So I'm just going to do some quick computations to grab uh, the abstract of this specific paper, uh, the term. Uh, so that's that PMC term with uh, the TN, TTNV in it um, and the PMC ID. And we can see this is the actual abstract of the paper that we were uh, that we're comparing it to here. Um, and we're looking at uh, these uh, Titan truncating variants and that they are a genetic cause of uh, dilated cardiomyopathy, the single largest cause. So finally, we can define a function here that actually generates our hypothesis. Uh, so we have our description of our gene set, we have our abstract, uh, then we have the term that we found and its abstract, uh, and then finally we have these enricher terms that we're going to insert into there. Um, so if we actually do that now, then we will get a um, hypothesis from GPT that will sort of try to connect these two gene sets using those enricher terms and using the abstracts of both the publications. In summary, uh, when you're doing these, creating these prompts, uh, we want to provide clear instructions on how uh, our, our task should be executed, provide the do's and don'ts, and uh, uh, a system prompt can be especially helpful in, in telling the model how to act. Um, we can utilize the function calling and, and knowledge or truth to incorporate predefined functions and vetted information from outside the model. So that helps address some of these issues with the hallucination, hallucination and uh, false information. And, uh, you know, like, like anything in, in machine learning and AI, uh, what you put into it is going to determine what you get out. So there's a common sort of uh, phrase, garbage in, garbage out. So uh, really, you have to sort of think about a lot what your what your inputs are going to be uh, in order to get sort of a strong hypothesis or, or output in general from these models. And finally, just uh, keep in mind, all of these uh, hypotheses, you know, have to be manually vetted and experimentally verified. There's certainly still uh, the opportunity for it to be incorrect in creating these hypotheses. Uh, but the real goal is to provide a starting point and a, that plausible explanation uh, for why those gene sets might connect. Uh, here are some helpful uh, resources, uh, some of the links I put on previous slides and a, and a couple extras um, uh, that I would recommend you check out if you're uh, curious and sort of exploring uh, more about what I've talked today. And finally, we'd just like to acknowledge the Mayan Lab um, and uh, all the people who have helped put together all these applications that I've talked about uh, and Dr. Mayan, of course, for his uh, guidance and uh, ideas in, in creating all of this. So thank you.